Hello. First, how are you everybody doing? Good? Everybody have a good day today? The sun is out. Day three, you guys have been being productive and feeling good about your week? Thumbs up? That's good. Okay, first thing I'd like to do is wish, her, wish Kamiko happy birthday. Day to you, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Kimiko. Happy birthday to you. Woo! Now we're gonna go around and each of us is gonna say one thing we love about Kimiko. So do you want us? No, I'm just kidding. We won't do that, okay. Um, but we do have our student reading tomorrow night, so if you haven't signed up, m give Kamiko a birthday present and <laughs> sign up for the student reading tomorrow. The thing is all, 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 almost full, though, so I'm, I'm pleased. Okay, that's good. Um, welcome to our third faculty event of the week. Uh, we're glad to see you all here. Uh, my name is David Simpson. I'm the program director here at the Work Center, and tonight we're going to hear from poet Chen Chen. <laughs> And from visual artist Pete Hawking. <laughs> Chen will read from his work and Pete will give an artist talk. And then we'll do a joint Q&A with both of them at the front of the room. So that's how it's going to go tonight. Chen's books will be for sale at the back of the, of, of the space after the event. And Chen will be signing books back there. And there's, of course, lots of books by all the faculty this summer back there as well as in the library, in the gallery. If you haven't been to the gallery yet this summer, please do so. The show that's up right now, Everyone We Know Is Here, um, is uh, a show of work by former fellows, uh, and it's beautiful. So I advise you to check it out. Um, as always, a big shout out to East End Books for managing our bookstore. <laughs> Restrooms are still down the hall, and aforementioned sign-up sheet is over there. And if one more thing, I heard a cell phone thing over here. So if you haven't turned it off, turn them off. I heard a ring, I did. Um, and now, without further ado, I'd like to invite Monica Yoon up to the stage to introduce Chen Chen. Monica, thank you. Thank you, David, and uh, everyone for being here. Um, so um, I'm going to read the uh, website, uh, uh, Chen's website bio, and then, uh, and then do my own little talk. Uh, so Chen Chen is an author, teacher, and editor, and his new book, Your Emergency, not that new, 2022, uh, Your Emergency Contact Has Experienced an Emergency, is now out from BOA Editions and Blood Axe Books in the UK. And the, the collection is a best book of 2022, according to the Boston Globe, Electric Lit, NPR, and others, and has been named a 2023 notable book by the American Library Association. Um, his debut volume, uh, When I Grow Up, I Want to Be a List of Further Possibilities, was published by BOA in 2017 and Blood Axe in 2019, and was long listed for the National Book Award and won the Tom Gunn Award, among many other honors. And Chen is also the author of five chapbooks, including the just released Explodingly Yours, uh, which is great. Uh, Ghost City Press 2023, and a forthcoming book of craft essays, in Cahoots with the Rabbit God, which is coming out in 2024. And his work appears in many publications, um, uh, including Poetry, Poem a Day, and three editions of the Best American Poetry. He has received two Pushcart Prizes and Felements from Kundiman, the National Endowment from the Arts and uh, for the Arts and United States Artists. Um, he holds an MFA from Syracuse and a PhD from Texas Tech. He has taught in UMass Boston's MFA program and at Brandeis University as the 2018-2022 Jacob Ziskin's Poet in Residence, and currently he's core of poetry faculty for the low residency MFA programs at New England College and Stone Coast. And with a brilliant team, he edits the journal Underblong with Gudatama, the lazy egg, who I must know more about. Um, he edits the Lickety Split 
and he lives in Rochester, New York, with his partner, Jeff Gilbert, and their pug, Mr. Rupert Giles. <laughs> And I first encountered Chen's work, like so many readers, with his debut volume, uh, When I Grow Up, I Want to Be, a list of further possibilities. And my students here know that I read poetry at first read for the level, at the level of craft. And there was so much in that book to love just at the level of craft. And I remember exclaiming to people, I had not met Chen, I actually only met Chen, I think last month in person, but that uh, Chen had invented like a new tone, like a tone I had not seen before, one that was so malleable and light and could be spread to cover so many different situations and possibilities that it was like discovering a new element on the periodic table. But then I read his new volume last year um, and I understood how insufficient my initial reading had been. And perhaps it was that I had changed so fundamentally during that time as a reader. It was a very fraught time. Uh, for this country, I think a lot of people were uh, reconsidering themselves. Um, and during that time, among many other things, I had reread uh, Giovanni's Room by James Baldwin, uh, which was a book I first read in college. And but this time I had read Baldwin's own comments on the novel, which for those of you who have not read it concerns the love affair of a young gay man in Paris and his relationship with a European man he meets there. And the race of the hero of Giovanni's room is, uh, which was written in 1956, is unspecified. And when Baldwin is asked about that, he said, well, it was too much to expect readers to understand a man who was both gay and black at the same time. Um, and this is, these are the words of James Baldwin, who of course later becomes one of our great exemplars of literary courage. And at the time, I had also been doing a lot of thinking about my most recent book, which I'd finished at the time, but which deals with the experience of being the daughter of Asian immigrants, though not an immigrant myself. And I had chosen for my book's epigraph a quote, quote from the Asian American artist Paul Chan. The quote is, is there a direction home that doesn't point backward? And so I read Chen's new book and I thought, I have so much I still need to learn about what it means to be searching for a sense of home. Because as signaled by the title, your emergency contact has experienced an emergency, is looking for a sense of safety, security, in an emergency situation, a sense of belonging that many of us are lucky enough to take for granted, to associate with home, and to understood how little of that can be taken for granted uh, by you know, someone who is a gay man, an immigrant himself, the child of immigrants, working very hard to establish a sense of security and belonging at a time when his relationship with his family is extremely fraught because of his sexuality, um, at a time when the nation is increasingly hostile and dangerous to gay men, to Asian American people, and to so many other populations, among so many other hatreds. And to understand how much creativity, generosity, and hope it takes to end this book on a note of welcome, right? A sense of hope found in a loving partnership a sense of community as a queer Asian American artist and editor, and a sense of purpose as a teacher of this art form. So I am honored and delighted to be able to introduce uh, Chen this evening, and I can't wait to hear him read. Oh my God, thank you, Monica. Okay, let me, uh, I'll just be recovering from that for the rest of the night. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, it's lovely to be back at the center. Um, I'm gonna read some poems. <laughs> um, some are old and some are new, uh, but most of them are from this uh, book that came out in the fall. We'll be gone after these brief messages. God stopped by in his magenta rowboat. I said, God, you have to stop stopping by if you're never gonna tell me the meaning of life. God said, life is meaningless. 
while language often means too much. My grandmother stopped by and said, no, the meaning of life is love, the kind that produces children. Why don't you have a girlfriend yet? <laughs> My mother stopped by and said, look, he's busy with his studies. Stop asking. God got back in his turquoise steamship. Life is a joyful thing, he said. It's probably very good for you. So sometimes I think part of the reason why I was in grad school for like seven years um, is so that my mother would continue having that excuse. He's studying a lot. Just can't stop studying. Doctor's note. Please excuse Chen Chen from class. He is currently dead. He came in last Thursday, exhibiting clear signs of dying, such as saying in a clear voice, I am nothing except the wish to listen to Coldplay. <laughs> and after, two, after one too many plays of their 2002 hit, The Scientist, he is dead. <laughs> Though few have improved from this condition, Chen Chen has been prescribed long baths in chicken stock and more recent music. Also, some rudimentary Tai Chi early each morning in his room with the curtains drawn. Medically speaking, Chen Chen's current state is very gross. It would be unwise, however, to try to force Chen Chen physically or with the promise of new Buffy episodes back into life. It would be unwise and gross to reach out to Chen Chen's parents. They are not his emergency contacts and have exhibited clear signs of wishing he were dead, such as saying in a clear voice, you'd be better off dead, better than whatever you are with other men. Of course, after learning of Chen Chen's death, they fell to their knees into a state commonly referred to as utter devastation. And it was, in a medical sense, satisfying to hear of their utter devastation. But studies show that this state is ultimately bupkis. Studies predict that if Chen Chen recovers, it will take around three months for his parents to find his fully restored state unsatisfying. Or, if he remains his remains, they will find themselves fully content with the memory of Chen Chen, their sweet Chen Chen, before he became so whatever he was. They will think of him so fondly while sharing a bowl of strawberry ice cream, the last thing they remember him loving. What poem is next? <laughs> This, makes, uh, this next poem makes reference to a character from Sailor Moon, um, Sailor Neptune, um, who is queer and has turquoise hair. And one of her weapons is a mirror, which I think is great. <laughs> if I can find the poem. I thought I marked it. Oh, no. I have t uh, long book syndrome. <laughs> I have to check my own table of contents. Oh, it's there? OK. <laughs> Spring, summer, autumn, winter. I push my face toward the sleeping radiator. I smelled a form of justice. I wanted to be a poet. I waved my living hands, dead coupons. I watched him brush his teeth. His teeth glinted gorgeous. I stumbled, cartwheeled. I said, I will always fight alongside you in the fight against tartar buildup. I said, I will. I said, thank God without believing in thanks. I thought what my parents did, that wasn't poetry. I believed what white people said about my parents. I had to say, stop, stop believing them. I suckled, pickled, made mistakes about octopi, wore a blue chalk strap and took pictures, accepted stickers of astounded apples from friends. I was a wind smooching another wind who had very good teeth. I was a name everyone in America thought they were saying right. Even he thought so, then asked, is that right? I pushed my face toward the noisy radiator, its clang and labor and here. In bed, I touched his voice in his belly. I touched his good night. He said it always like it was important. It was important. 
I believed in the silver millennium. I said, Sailor Neptune, one day a poem for you. I said, Sailor Neptune, teach me the deep submerge, the submarine reflection, the thunderously turquoise hair. I was a name in America and would forget I belonged to my teeth. I dropped a single wish down the cavernous mailbox. He would ask, is that right? He would bring a single microwave donut on a blue napkin at dusk. He would leave me alone with my poems. Oh, if I could lick all your toes at once, I would write that poem. I loved him, I told him. I loved him, so told him about the dream. The dream starred my parents, stars of a death metal band's debut music video. They danced like everyone was watching. It was important. Their arms were poems. They said, so what if we misspell auditorium? So fucking what? We'll always say your name, right? They pushed their faces toward me, their poems toward me. They leapt and thrashed. They were stars, stars, stars. I woke up weeping. Do you understand? I thought I could only fall asleep doing that. This next poem is sexy. Ode to Rereading Rambo in Lubbock, Texas. In the armpit of summer, in the asshole of August, in the what the fuck am I doing of more grad school, I'm in the 20th grade, rereading Rambo's Sonnet de Tout de Coup, co-authored with his often fucked up sometimes boyfriend, Verlaine. Their joint ode to the asshole, the literal hole puckering, the literal hole the surrounding hairs, the metaphorical lips and hunger, in Lubbock, Texas, in Jesus Saves and Buddy Holly Rocks, in Guns Up and Ah, That Line Break, in recently voted second most conservative city in the country, in the year marriage equality is made the law of the land, in the year the law is laughed at, spat on, called a sign of the end. I reread the sonnet, the ode, then go, inspired, horny, to the one I love. Tongue in armpit and asshole, tongue on cock on cock, tongue in love. My poetics of deep throat and tongue fuck. I love my poetics. From the French, la mousse humide en cours d'amour. From the American, it smells like ass in here. <laughs> From between my love cheeks, I sing my song of merde, that's good. Thank goodness for alternatives to penis and anus. Thank goodness for cocks and Rambeau and butts and sonnets and amour and ass and Verlaine and dicks in the relentless middle of summer in Lubbock. Oh, Lubbock, why did I choose you? How did my boyfriend choose to come with me? The name makes me think buttock and banana and hammock. So why isn't Lubbock the new Fire Island or P-Town? <laughs> for months I dreamt it was, could be. I was teenage me again, dreaming of making out, moving in with Jake Gyllenhaal, dreaming of the day I could bring a boyfriend, a Jake, home. At times I thought, if only, and tried to see myself picking out nightstands with Maggie Gyllenhaal. Now I see even a little gay sex in French poetry would make some folks better citizens. Now there's my Jeff, who fixes the computer, fixes us dinner, fucks my face, a eh, mon am. Isn't that enough of a gay paradise? All we need is another couple for mahjong. Or one other person plus Lily, what one online mahjong guide calls the imaginary missing player. What an absurd concept. A beautiful name. Lily, come over. Lily, let's watch your favorite movie. Do you prefer comedy, drama, action, or movies with Jake Gyllenhaal in them? Do you like spicy foods? My boyfriend does not, but I love him anyway. Lily, whom do you love? And is it possible to hold hands with your love on the brightest street, in the bustle and heat of your town? Lily, after another round of mahjong, let's imagine a Lubbock we'd want to live in. Let's ask our favorite imaginary missing players to help. Ask Rambeau to come, and maybe not date a gun-toting French symbolist this time. Ask Verlaine to come, to put down his absinthe, his pistol. Let's say, come back, come to Lubbock, come a big creamy load on all the bullshit. Instead of huddling in the corner of Maxi Park, let's make Lubbock Gay Pride stream through 34th Street, through Buddy Holly Avenue. Let's bring back the best slang term for homosexual, cockpipe cosmonaut. <laughs> let's shout. Let's make sure every homo gleam naughty cosm gets good food, good rest, gets the goods of marriage without having to get married. Let's holler troublemongers in the lick of many summers. 
Thank you. <clears throat> this next one features uh, Wegmans, the supermarket chain. The School of Eternities. Do you remember the two types of eternity? How we learned about them in a Wegmans parking lot? When you turned on the radio, the classical channel? Why were they even talking about eternity? What did it have to do with the suddenly broody guitars? You had a peach snapple. I remember the snappy, kissy sound of the lid coming off in your hand. One type of eternity, they said, is inside of time, as endless time, life without death. We were inside our Toyota. I said, we need a new umbrella. Do you remember when we first rhymed? Do you remember the first time I asked you about the rain, the expression, it's raining cats and dogs, whether it was equally cats and dogs falling? Can you remember when you learned the word immortality? The hosts on the classical channel were okay. I thought you'd do a much better job. I remember saying so while you drove us home. Our apartment, our third. Remember the day we moved into our first? The boxes of books and boxes of books, my books, are sweating up three flights of the greenest stairs. And you said never again, and the again, and again, and. The other type of eternity is outside of time, beyond it, no beginning, no end. I remember your hand, the lid, your hands, the steering wheel, your lips, your lips, the way you took a sip, gave me a kiss before starting to drive. Do you remember the first time you drove me home? before home meant where we both lived. The books on the shelves, the books in the closet when I ran out of shelves, the second apartment, West Texas. Remember the dust, the flat, another type of eternity, that dusty sun. And driving to the supermarket, what was it called there? And that hand soap we get, which scent was your favorite? I don't remember what it was called, can't remember exactly the smell, but your hands after washing, I remember kissing them. Don't you remember when we thought only some things were ephemera? Can you remember when you learned the word ephemera, the word immortality? Probably the latter first. And isn't that something, immortality first, than menus and movie tickets? What was the first nickname, the fifth umbrella, the type of taco you ordered on our 16th trip? Remember driving? Remember when we thought the world of the world? Remember how I signed the letter, explodingly yours? Do you remember you were driving? We were halfway home, only eight minutes from Wegmans. Remember when we measured distance in terms of Wegmans? Like it was a lighthouse, or a pyramid, or a sacred tree. Remember when your name was Fluttersaurus Bex, and mine wasn't. Remember when I lived like a letter, falling in cartoonish slow-mo down four flights of stairs? Did you picture a letter of the alphabet or a letter I'd written to you? Remember when I asked you about the rain, when the wizard jumped out, when I lied and you laughed, when I lied and I lied and I lied? Can you remember last night how I crossed my arms as though dead and arranged just so? How I pictured my face polished as though alive? And no, you can't remember that since it happened while you were sleeping and I wasn't. I was up, wondering why people always talk about death as sleep, and how much I love sleep, hate death. And have I told you about the student who said, I'm really, really afraid of death? Just like that, in class. It was fitting, because it was poetry class. Ha ha. And I loved it, her saying that. Want to say I loved it, but couldn't. I was thinking about you sleeping, and me not, about me sleeping, and you not. And what even is outside of time, beyond, then, now, no thanks. I prefer the type of eternity where we are inside, are us. And last night's movie, good, not great. A stray piece of popcorn still under our coffee table. Do you remember when the world signed the letter, yours ephemerally? Remember when I asked you about the rain, the cats and dogs of it, if it was 50% cats, 50% dogs, 100% falling, and you said, of course. And you said, she's gotten, the flight's not till, I'm going to drive. I remember you driving to your mother, West Texas to upstate New York. You didn't make it in time, she had little time, then none. I remember your face pressed into my shoulder. I remember your mother was an endless, a question your face asked into my shoulder, how I wanted it to answer because I couldn't. I didn't go with you when I could have. I chose a poetry reading instead. 
thought, she'll be there, you'll be. Is memory the best eternity we can make, the only? And you said it's equal, the cats and dogs raining down, though in terms of overall volume. The rain, it's all the different breeds of cat, of dog, and see, there are more individual cats, since there are more very large breeds of dog. The cats have to balance things out with their number, but the dogs, don't you worry, they're raining down too, and they're rain, absolutely, there's still rain, the cats and dogs. Lots of water for the plants, for the flowers, for the whole street, and our dusty car windows, for the cats and dogs on the ground, the cats and dogs that aren't rain, at least not yet, and maybe that's another eternity the rainy type. I remember you drove us home. The radio was on. We made a sound like a lid coming off. Okay, I'm going to read maybe two new poems. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, she said, so doubly and quickly over the phone. Then quiet, like the rabbit by the mailbox this morning, scurrying away through Wyoming snow, as though they've just delivered too large a piece of news. But I could tell if she meant it, I heard it. This was her, my mother, apologizing. But then she added, you know, I'm Chinese, as if I'm not also Chinese, as if there's only one and it's her. And this was after I said, I'm not coming back for Christmas unless you apologize, really, this time. And this time I said, you can't keep saying you're Chinese. You can't, you can do better. Because it doesn't, it never did explain away the fights all the nights screaming at me to be a normal boy. When I'm not, I'm lucky. I'm doing Friendsgiving with new friends, fellow artists at a kind of winter art monastery I've got on my pink sweater, pink corduroy trousers with red, red hearts embroidered. And after these stylishly cloistered weeks away, I'll be kissing my boyfriend's entire face very well. I'm happy, very, because Jeff's made a superlative salmon at his Friendsgiving, and he's promised to, of course, make it again when I'm home. And home is his hands, our bowls, so many gay fridge magnets. And home is every friend who's been telling me, tell her, Tell your mother exactly what you need her to stop telling you. And home is how I no longer need her approval for, her proud of. I need her kind to. Kind as a post rabbit on holiday, delivering nothing but softness, softly. And home is the way I stayed calm over the phone, then wept. Over how I do want to see her at Christmas, her astonishing plaid outfits, her platter of beef and glistening bell peppers her bowl of steaming, singing green beans that always made up for the screaming until they did it. Okay, I think I'll read one more poem. It's called I Hate You. (laughs) I don't wanna like look at anyone. I hate you. (laughs) I hate you, I love you. When uttered solely to blood family and to those beloveds we bed. And don't, and I don't love to hate this. I hate to hate this. I hatefully hate the notion that we must reserve I love you for these groups, conserve it for those most holiday, maximally candlelit of occasions. Isn't today an occasion? Isn't that moon who so hates being photographed by our silly phones more than enough celebration? Friends, I love you. Oak tree still extending branch after branch of daydreaming, daydreamy shade to my childhood, I love you. Pine trees across the street that look to be lifelong pals who love to argue about Scandinavian film. Such opining pines whom I can see from my faux maple desk as I hate write about hating the restrictions placed on I love you. I love you. Puns and hair and terrifyingly great dreams of my friends. I love you. I am shaking with love with love for you. Dill pickle chips and Massachusetts shaped paper clips. I love you. Night, I love you. 
day except for the very early morning. I love you. <laughs> Friend who made sure we got up and brought our little fold-out chairs and our already half-devoured bag of dill pickle chips to the beach so we could watch the sun rise over the Atlantic. The words are inadequate, kind of pathetic, yes, but why shouldn't our feeling-filled, feel-spilling actions also be spoken about, aloud, frankly, quite? I can't quietly wait to call you again, to show and tell you again, again, to lovingly I love you, to lovely you, tonight or tomorrow, though maybe it should be in 15 to 20-ish. Thank you, and happy birthday, Kamiko. I think we need to give Chen Shen another big round of applause. Thank you, Chen Shen. I love my job. I first met Pete Hawking in 2017 through our mutual friend, Liz Carney. As part of a previous job, I was going to bring 20 young artists here from DC for a summer vacation. I contacted Liz, who owns the 411 Gallery on Commercial, which if you haven't been to, you should go to, because a show by Pete Hongi is hanging up there, um, because I thought it'd be great to have somebody up here give a talk to our young artists about the history of art in P-Town. She asked Pete, and he agreed to do it. So one afternoon, we stopped by the 411 Gallery, and Pete, who worked at, at and is represented by the gallery, welcomed us and for the next 30 minutes or so, shared with us his deep knowledge of the arts in Provincetown and answered all the questions our kids had about making art, about living as an artist, about life. And after the talk, he invited us out to the beach behind the gallery where we, ate, we all ate our Farland sandwiches and he continued to engage with the kids for over an hour. He was welcoming, kind, and generous with our young artists on that day and on subsequent visits over the years, and he has continued to be so with me as a friend and as a mentor. I have so much admiration for Pete's commitment to local artists through his involvement with the 411 Gallery and as president of the board of the Provincetown Commons, a local nonprofit committed to facilitating a year-round creative economy on the Cape. He is a tireless advocate for art and for building community and support of local artists and he is an incredibly talented artist. His paintings are bold, gorgeous manifestations of his love for the natural environment of the Cape. And you should really go see that show because it's really wonderful. Uh, Pete Hawking has taught at the Rhode Island School of Design where he served four years as their public engagement director and taught in the MFA Interdisciplinary Arts Program at Goddard College for nearly 20 years. He served as the Associate Dean and Director of the Swearer Center for Public Service at Brown University and is the Board President of Provincetown Commons. He is represented by 411 Gallery in Provincetown, where he explores work that is concerned with personal narrative, place, poetics, and political consciousness. It is my privilege and honor and delight to welcome Pete Hawking to the stage. It's so lovely to be brought back to that day with the young people that you spent so much time with mentoring. And so um, I've had a lot of jobs like David and, and, and often in a moment like this you say, last but not least, but I actually think I am least. What an incredible group of artists we've gotten to witness this week. So I just wanna thank all of you for what you've shared with me and how meaningful that's been. Um, this is really fragmentary. I, I'm, I'm a little overwhelmed by the presentations that my colleagues have made and how cohesive they've been and how they've gotten to the heart of their work. And I started to think just about my work over time and how fragmented it is and how many different places I've worked and different things that I've done that in my life feel like all the same thing. But when I'm asked to summarize who I am today, I'm like, I'm a landscape painter in Provincetown 
and that just doesn't sort of tell the story. So I'm gonna try today to weave together several threads. And so I've sort of named this Incomplete Origins in My Search for Place. And there's gonna be a lot of Elijahs in it, there's gonna be a lot of spaces and a lot of gaps, and I'm gonna do this in 10 minutes. <laughs> This is my birth mother. I was taken from her on the second day of my life. I've never met her. I never will. As an adopted person, I was displaced, replaced, misplaced. And my work is all about place, unsurprisingly. Um, there are a lot of ways to unpack this and unfold this. I think one uh, important thing for me to say right now is this woman who I never met had no choice about my birth and she had no choice about my adoption. And what I know of her is that that haunted her for the rest of her life because it created levels and levels of trauma. And that's another story for me to tell. So I'm gonna talk about my own trauma. I put this photograph up, it's a little bit of jump in time from the second day of my life to my 14th year. But I put this up because as a photograph, I think there's a certain twinning between us. And as an adopted person, that's one of the things that's missing in my life. All of the metaphors of place, Kamiko, you said so beautifully and so truthfully, home is my mother's body. And I loved hearing that. But it is, a, it, it is a, um, an idea like you have your father's temper, you have your mother's eyes, that never made sense to me. And there is a way as an adopted person of being displaced and misplaced. It's not simply from your family of origin, but it's from the experience of being fully human and having these kinship ties that give you a sense of belonging in place. And so much of my life has felt you know, like I'm on the outside looking in. And one way I have come to think about this is the replacement is that I was brought into a world to replace an idea, which was the idea of the unconceived child of my parents. And so for my life with those people, I was playing a role. I was not unpacking who I am. And so while that life was happening, I also carried with me a ghost life and a search to find whatever that home was in that ghost life. And the first moment I sort of experienced it was when I was in this version of this body. Um, that's my little Cape Cod t-shirt. You can sort of see the, the sailboat there. And this is the moment I fell in love. This is um, a, a view off of a road in Wellfleet called Ocean View Avenue, or Ocean View Drive, rather. And um, my mother's cousin lived in Wellfleet, and um, when I was 14 years old, my sister had a very, very bad car accident where she was in traction for the summer. And there were a lot of sort of things going on that my parents wanted me to sort of get me out of the way. So they dropped me off with her cousin and my, with my 10 speed. My aunt would have her first cocktail at 11.30 in the morning and a second one with lunch and she would go for a nap uh, at one and she would not rise again until the five o'clock news came on where she would pour another cocktail and yell Republican things at the television. And what I knew is I had this moment of time and as a 14 year old, I got on my 10 speed and I started to explore the world. And in this place with my uh, 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 Instamatic uh, Kodachrome camera, I decided to document the most beautiful thing I had ever seen, which was this undulating um, uh, landscape going down. And when it came back, I said to my mother, this isn't what I took. She's like, no depth of field. Um, but I still have the photograph, because this is where I fell in love. And um, I, I would ride my 10 speed to Provincetown because in my aunt's, my mother's cousin, my aunt, her, um, 
her republicanisms included the gays are killing Provincetown. They're just ruining it. And I was like, this is interesting to me. <laughs> I'm going to go see one afternoon. And just as an aside, I wasn't planning to tell the story. The, the Whaler's Wharf used to be this kind of big flea market. And I was 14 years old, and I went in there. And there was a vendor who um, was uh, um, selling bandanas in every color. And um, unbeknownst to me, this was a code <laughs> called the Hanky Code. And you put something in your back pocket to advertise what you were interested in. So I bought one in every color. <laughs> and I still have them. Um, but it was, it was this, this blind introduction to a place that resonated with me on a almost unconscious level that, that there was something I had to know about this. And I arrived. But this is actually the moment of my origin story where I fell in love with this place. And in fact, I, my parents came to pick me up at, at some point and, um, and I declared in my 14-year-old bravado, I have decided who I am and what I'm gonna do. And it was, I'm going to live on Cape Cod, and I'm going to paint this landscape. I'm going to be an artist. And immediately slamming down a window, you are absolutely not doing that. There are no jobs on Cape Cod, and artists are queer. I won the art school fight. <laughs> so three years after that, I was admitted to Rhode Island School of Design. And as I emerged as an undergraduate artist, it is the landscape, the landscape of Providence, Rhode Island, that I started to look at, the intersection of the industrial world and um, the natural world. Because for me, in some way, that was where I was trying to find myself. Urban environments are a place where queerness can arise, um, often uh, post-industrial spaces like the one on the horizon there are places of meeting. Um, but my draw was still to that view, that intersection of air, water, and land. Um, in the middle of my undergraduate career, I decided studio practice, being alone all the time, and making art was not for me, and that there were things to do in the world. And I became a social activist, and I have a turn in my career. And this is one of the you know, uh, blank spots, is that I ran a, a, a social change and community action and leadership program for 17 years. And then I went to grad school. And in grad school, uh, I had teachers who did not believe in painting. Painting was dead. Painting was the worst thing ever. Everything had to be conceptual. And um, to be the artist that I needed to be, I had to hang my practice as a painter on a conceptual crutch. So I went back to being adopted. And for a series of years, I made these double self-portraits Imagining, I said at the beginning, my birth mother's story is not mine to tell. My birth father's story is entirely unknown. Um, my birth mother's story is her own. This cipher in my life of you know the biological fact, as Margaret Mead said, of fatherhood, um, is uh, something that I could explore because the twinning of my own body worked for me as a metaphor there. So I made a series of these paintings. This is an interior. They're always 17 years apart in age. Um, uh, sometimes they're funny, like, oops, I did it again. I think I skipped over one. Let me go back and see it. Yeah, this is the first, the, no the nocturne. And so for a picture of period of time, I was a figurative painter. And then she returned, in a way. <clears throat> I initiated a search to find out who she was. 
And in the state of Connecticut, the way you're supposed to do it, and being at my heart a good boy, I went through that system, in part because I wanted to interrogate it as an activist, maybe not such a good boy. And the system is this, that um, there's a confidentiality agreement that is mediated by the state between the birth mother and the child, and the, really the child's family, um, where we have to keep this really quiet. And um, so activists chipped away at that, and that there is a provision now that you can um, go to the agency from which you were adopted, and they have to have a caseworker who is trained to do searches. And so I worked with the caseworker, who was marvelous, and she worked very hard, and she, I occasionally have phone calls with her, and she'd be like, well, I'm making a little progress, and I found this, but I can't tell you. And, you know, and, um, and one of the things in this, to peel away the sort of misogyny and the um, social control of the state is, um, she had a brother and a sister, but they never took their first names. So it was like younger brother, older sister. So in terms of doing a search, the brother's name is the one that is probably most stable without having been changed by marriage. But there was no clue there. And in any case, it kept coming back. No, I'm no, no. And then one day the phone rang in November of 2011. And the caseworker said, how are you? And I said, I'm fine. And she said, are, are you sitting down? And I said, I can be. And she said, well, I have some news to share with you. And I said, OK. And she said, I found your birth mother. And she's dead. And I said, OK. And she said, her sister called. She died two months ago. And her sister called because she was talking to her about reconnecting with you because I found her. But she wasn't willing to give consent, so I wasn't willing to tell you no. She was working on it. And she died. And she said, here's the problem. The contract is void. I am legally obligated to give you her name because you can know her in death. But the family doesn't know that her sister has called and they don't want to hear from you, although her sister does want to meet you. So it's complicated. So I can't tell you what to do, but what I advise you to do is to wait for her to reach out to you and understand they're grieving. That's a traumatic space for a lot of people. And it's part of the origin story. She is unknowable. I am unknowable to her. And so the, the, the gift that I got out of this is magic. We are talking about that last night. So the social worker says to me, so are you really sitting down? Because we've been talking for a while and we're, you know, it's, a, it's an emotion, it's all over the place. We're laughing, we're crying, we're doing all the things. And she said, so, she died 10 miles from where you live. I said, really? She goes, yeah. And we're, neither of us are from there. And she goes, this is even weirder. She lived even closer. And it turns out she lived four blocks down the street from me for five years. And I said, Jesus Christ, that's crazy. I maybe said fuck. And, and, and she said, no, no. She, she goes, yeah, it happens all the time. And I said, what? She said, yeah, it happens all the time. And in fact, in the literature, it happens all the time. There is this kind of, for lack of a better word, magnetism. 
She is buried on Cape Cod. I have always loved Cape Cod. She lives on Cape Cod. I visited the grave the next day. It's halfway between where I lived in Providence and Provincetown. I visited her grave and I thought, hmm, maybe it's time to go to Provincetown to have lunch. And I started a journey back here. And Provincetown is the promise of a queer utopia, <laughs> unfulfilled. But there is a story about Provincetown that is hopeful and that offers a beacon for the possibility of a world that is more just, more accepting. Provincetown is nowhere near the story we tell about it, but it is a promise. And I think it is something we need to continue to work towards. I came here to write a book. I came here to write a book about Diane and me. So I rented a little apartment above 411 Gallery, and I was, had my little writing garret, and, and I got stuck. So I went to MFA school and got a creative writing MFA to write this book, to figure this out. What does it mean that my birth mother lived five, you know, that all of these twinning things that start to emerge in the story? And as I'm doing that, Liz Carney, who David mentioned, is running a gallery downstairs. And I'm a painter, so I go down and I talk to her about painting. And she says, why don't you have a show? And I say, you've never seen my paintings. And she says, the way you talk about painting, I know I'll like them. <laughs> and in a moment, she changes my life, which I think, in a sense, is also the magic of this relationship with this woman I've never met. And the first line of my graduate school MFA in creative writing thesis is, nothing got me back to the painting studio faster than doing an MFA in creative writing. <laughs> so this is the beginning of a long, long love letter, and that was 2013 that I had my first show at 411 Gallery. My work is really interested in that spot I fell in love, that spot at the edge of the earth, that spot of both peril and possibility, that spot where storms transform the world, but we also perhaps get as close as possible to whatever it is that at least I experience as the source. And so that's what my work is about. I paint for a domestic audience. I make landscape paintings because I want people to live with art. I keep my prices as accessible as possible because I want people to live with things that are physically made by other people. I want people who love this place. Another thing I should say about the promise of a queer utopia, it took me a while to figure out, I'd be here and there's all these people who fucking own this place. Like, and, and, and this is the spiritual home for at least a million people. They come here and they have transformational experiences and it may be a week of their life, but they always think of this as their spiritual home. There is something unusual about this place that way. And over time I've come to realize I need to embrace that. It is owned by millions and millions of people over time. It's owned by layers of history, layers of culture. And, um, and again, I, I want to be able to reflect back my love of this so that people can carry a piece of that wherever they're going. These are just a few examples of uh, work that I've made over the last four or five years. Um, I spent a lot of time on what used to be called the backside, the Atlantic edge where the dunes are. Um, these are uh, paintings that are not made, I don't carry these big canvases out there and paint on site. I go and I bring the landscape into my body and, the bod and then that work comes through the body. 
I have a series of paintings that I call my ghost houses. And this, I think, is kind of a, a reflection back to my birth mother, which is um, a ghost you walk right through. I put this in because this is about a particular trip I took into the dunes with particular people. So there, there are also these moments of just reflecting on experience and relationship. Um, I did a whole series in Great Island. My adoptive parents had uh, also had a relationship with this place. My mother first came here in 1936 as a 12 year old as a babysitter for her cousin and came probably every year until 2004 when her cousin died. Um, and so uh, Great Island was the place that as a child they would drag me. I'd be like, this is the most boring place on earth. Why are we here? It's so stony. I don't like this. And as an adult, I went back and I was like, oh my God, this is, this is absolutely gorgeous. And after my mother died, I went back there and I, I realized they had a whole life here and a whole set of meanings. And when they were engaged, they walked in this place. And you know, who knows what sort of promises they made to each other walking in this place. And so it was a kind of a way to do an elegy to them. This is where my work is sort of now becoming more abstract, um, but still referencing the place. And then the final thing is, um, David mentioned the commons. I'm part of the leadership team of the commons and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm uh, privileged to be the, the chair of the board of directors right now. Um, this building was built in 1935 as a six-room neighborhood elementary school. And in 1957, it became the town community center. And in 2010, the town reorganized its services and closed it down. And it went up for bid several times unsuccessfully, and it was up for bid again. And a small group of us got together to say, we can't lose this. There's something here that we have to do. And so we've put together a center for what we call arts and the creative economy. It really is a place for people to work who are doing creative work. So we have a co-working space with a lot of filmmakers, um, literary editors, writers, a couple of attorneys, a guy who like offloads cargo containers from major ports, just you know, virtually. I, I mean, it's a really, really fascinating, beautiful community of people. And then we have uh, 12 subsidized studios for emerging artists who are living here, mostly, most of whom are living here full time and trying to hold on to the dream of some sort of creative utopia here in a time of massive gentrification. We have exhibition space, a sculpture garden in front, and meeting rooms for people to come together. Urvashi Vad, the civil rights leader, was one of the leadership team. Uh, Urvashi um, died recently, and we have just kicked off a capital campaign to create the Urvashi Vad Changemakers Fund because we want to become a, a, a place where Urvashi's legacy can continue through um, activism and direct um, engagement in the world. So. I stop here because in all of my places, in all of the stops when I was young, I expected as a good American capitalist raised child that community was to be consumed, that it was there waiting for me. And I have learned through my work over the last 40 years that we are all obligated to create community where we go. And that means cultivating relationships, reaching across difference, and creating the potential and opportunity. What I'm most proud about the commons is not that I'm the chair or even that people know that I'm the chair of the board, but that people meet each other there who wouldn't otherwise meet each other in this place that is increasingly stratified by money, class, experience, race, um, and, uh, and that's as much my work as being a painter. So thank you very much.
Chen, I was just wondering, you published chapbooks and books. How do you decide what goes in a chapbook and how do you decide what goes in a book? That's a great question. <laughs> um, sometimes when I have too many poems, <laughs> um, which is exactly what happened with uh, this uh, latest collection. Um, so when I was putting together Emergency Contact, I was like, there are so many poems, <laughs> and I forgot. I wrote some of these. Um, and I still like many of these, but not all of them work for this book. Um, and I kept coming back to that long poem that I read, The School of Eternities, um, which has that phrase, explodingly yours, um, which comes from a friend of my partner's. Um, and I just thought that would be a great title for something. Um, and I kept doing that poem, looking at uh, the poems that didn't make it into the book. And um, I started to see that I could create a different conversation um, with those uh, poems that had been cut, um, along with this long poem in kind of a different context. And so the chapbook came out of that. And you know, there are all these queer love and sex poems. Um, so yeah, that's one way it happens. Thank you. Hi, first of all, thank you for having the last word, Peter. That was just really remarkable, uh, really remarkable. And, and you, Chen, on this uh, evening. My question is uh, a little craft, for both of you, is a little craft-based, which is um, I know in my workshop this week, but also in workshops I've, ta I've taught over the years, students oftentimes say, I don't know how to get a good title. So I'm curious for both of you how you come up with titles for your paintings and for your poems and books. I have a fairly simple, when, when I'm working on a body of work, I usually put together a playlist. And um, the music is part of the weaving process. And I often go back and pull lyrics and find fragmentary text. Um, I also, while I'm working on bodies of work and I'm reading poetry, I will pull fragments of poetry. So for example, there's a, there's a painting that's maybe in the gallery or maybe has been sold, I'm not sure, but it, it, it's three lines of a, an uh, Adrian Rich poem. And uh, you know, it, it, it's um, uh, written on the back that it's an Adrian Rich poem. Um, and, and that, you know, again, is this interweaving of thinking and ideas and experience in the world because it's never one thing. It's always all of these layers. Pete, first of all, I want to just say how moved I am by your whole presentation um, and just what a remarkable storyteller you are. Um, and I was thinking about uh, the paintings of yours that um, are titled uh, with friends' names. Um, and I love that approach. I've been wanting to do something like that. Um, earlier today in class, we talked briefly about a Frank O'Hara poem called Katie. Um, so this way that uh, a name is so intimate and it has its own lyricism as well. So I'm really drawn to that. Um, but yeah, I keep um, like a running note in Notes app of potential titles. It hasn't been as useful <laughs> as I would like it to be. <laughs> um, where I'm like, this is great. I'll just like come up with all these titles. And then if I'm stuck, I'll just, it doesn't really work like that. So I have, uh, I've ended up using some of them as lines. Um, so they get, they cycle through in different ways. Um, but yeah, some it's kind of either immediately, I know. Um, and sometimes it's really generative. So the title is kind of like a first line and everything follows from that. Um, it gives me like a base rhythm or emotion to follow. Um, and then other times I have no idea <laughs> for months or longer. Um, 
and those are very sad <laughs> times. <laughs> I'm like, what are you called? What are you called? <laughs> you know, like shaking it. Uh, and yeah, and so sometimes I'll ask friends, <laughs> you know, phone a friend. Um, but yeah, eventually it, you know, it happens. Um, but yeah, I, I become obsessed with uh, certain kinds of titles, um, so like a long sentence kind of title, or um, I've been really wanting to write like an untitled. Um, France Wright has a really beautiful one, um, but I'm like, I don't know what that would mean yet for me, so playing around with it. I'm not quite sure how to phrase this, but um, for both of you, um, I was noticing a connection of talking about queerness and family and um, really like community and that how, how vital that link is. Um, and I'm really curious, how do you balance the uh, I don't know, I'll, I'll speak for myself here and say that as a queer person who values community and is a working artist, I, I just struggle with the, um, the kind of duality that creates where like, you know, there's a lot of space that I need to create work and I feel that I wanna be as engaged as possible in community, so I don't know. I'm just I'm just curious to hear from both of you, like how you engage with balancing those those things in your lives. Yeah, I mean, mothers. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a big subject. In fact, I think there's an anthology. Maybe I'm making it up, but I think there's an anthology of. Um, uh, writing about like like uh, queer men writing about their relationship with their mothers um, in various ways. Um, but yeah, I'm, think, I'm trying to think about this question some more. I don't I don't know if I do balance things. To be honest, um, I think it's more that I go through different periods where I'm more focused on one thing and then the other, and I guess. It's more that I think in terms of cycles, like, oh, I'm gonna go through a period where I'm not writing as much, and I'm focused on doing things, you know, in my communities, um, and that's fulfilling in this whole other way. And then maybe I'll bring some of that energy back to my writing. But I guess I don't plan it out very much, yeah. I mean, one of the things I took from your your beautiful reading and amazing poems is um, they're infused with moments of self-invention where as queer people we have to continually invent ourselves because our families often don't understand who we are, what we need, and in fact are the opposite of that, that they're telling us it, that, that we're supposed to be something else. And the, the metaphor of the unconceived child that I talked about, about being an adoptee, is, is similar. Like, I, I lived in this role of this set of expectations that I was somehow gonna be genetically, you know, related to these people who raised me. And, and in that was a huge lost opportunity. And I think in these relationships with family, again, as I read y you talking about the unfolding of your relationship with your mother, I just, in those spaces, it's like she's losing out on so much, which is the, you know, the, 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 the horror in some way on the flip side of homophobia is how much homophobes are lose, l like losing in experience of the world. Um, I also, I don't, I'm really suspicious of the word balance because it feels psychotherapeutic that we're supposed to be integrated and balanced. And I find myself to be fragmentary and always trying to create connection. And, and so I think about this through like an ecological lens. There's an idea of an ecotone, which is the space between two dominant um, uh, ecologies. So if you think about the forest as a, an ecology that um, 
is you know, self-perpetuating in, in whatever those systems are. And you think about the farm, which is an artificial ecology that is perpetuated by the needs of farmers to do certain tasks. There's the meadow in between. And there are things that happen in the meadow that can't happen on the farm and they can't happen in the forest. Um, tide pools operate in a similar sort of way between land and ocean. And, and I think like I'm just racing between these different ecologies and sub-ecologies for what I need when I need it. That's so beautiful. <laughs> I'll just add, um, yeah, in, in this book, I was really thinking a lot about, I think, these severely under-discussed aspects of homophobia especially familial homophobia, and this sense of, yeah, exactly what you said, of the parent losing out on having an actual relationship um, with their queer child. And I was thinking a lot about what does it mean to actually be alive to someone else um, when they're fixated on freezing you in time and in a nostalgic image of you that maybe never existed, right? Their kind of fantasy heterosexual child um, and how they can't stop seeing that image overlaid on who you actually are and how much communication that perver uh, prevents. Um, because I just realize all the time, like you don't actually ask me about my real adult life. <laughs> and my full life, and you're much more comfortable continuing to treat me as a child. And I think there's this infantilizing quality to homophobia in general, of this perception that, oh, you don't really know what you're doing. You don't know the life that you're supposed to be living. And why don't you give up these you know, little playthings and join you know, the real society? Um, so it's really pervasive, I think, that mentality. Hi, thank you both. I feel the conversation's very meaningful to me as well. And so I want to acknowledge that. And it's wonderful to hear your um, talk and hear you read. So I want to ask both of you a little about your the process of your creation, and specifically about when do you know the piece of work is ready and or finished, because we can keep working on the same thing forever. There's always infinite possibilities. Um, but, I mean, deadlines are there. I mean, it's also uh, generative, but also deadline aside, aside, what do you find help you stopping at the place that you feel satisfied with? And I want maybe hear it a little more concretely and then just like, um, it's all about intuition. So I wonder how you would talk about it. How do we talk about it? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to start with a joke. And that is uh, Andy Warhol would say, when it's sold. Um, and, and so, I, I, mean, I mean, that's, th there, is a, there is a way in which for me, there's actually truth in that of the work is never done. It's always part of a larger process. And every painting is the unfolding towards the next painting. And it's a question of working out questions and problem solving as you're going along. And then there's a moment that you need to make a thing. And that might be an individual object. It might be an installation. It might be an exhibition. Um, it might be a book. And th there's a series of choices that go in that may never feel entirely satisfying. But um, I always remind myself, this is a snapshot in time of this moment where my process as an artist is, as an artist is. And I want to make sure that my ethical concerns 
um, in my work are, are attended to so that I don't look back at it 10 years from now and say like, ooh, I'm, you know, that's really bad and I can't believe I said that and wasn't that insulting and, you know, so there, there are those ethical concerns um, that I'm always checking. Um, but I try to be tender with myself about um, this is the work that I'm doing right now and this is a reflection of the moment. And um, maybe it will be received and maybe it won't, but maybe the reception is 10 years from now because the audience hasn't shown up yet. Hmm. Yeah, same, I mean. Um, I mean, I, I'm always surprised uh, by what people like <laughs> in my work. Because um, sometimes it's quite different from my own <laughs> relationship to the work. And so that's something I try to keep in mind, too, that as the writer or the artist, like you have a relationship to the work that might be, you know, it converges, but it also diverges from public opinion. Um, but yeah, I mean, a couple of things I do um, with poems is I think reading out loud is really important. Um, so for instance, uh, Doctor's Note, uh, one of the poems I read, um, the ending went through quite a different, uh, quite a few different versions. Um, and it was actually, I was uh, touring with uh, this other poet, Keisha Kuypers, uh, who we share a publisher, and she invited me to do the, this Northeast tour when her new book came out. Um, and uh, I read maybe a different version of that poem every night um, in different cities. Um, I just kept changing the ending um, to see what would happen. Where I was like, do I want it to be kind of sadder? What kind of image do I want it to be? Do I want it to still be funny? Um, so I just tried out a bunch of different things. Um, and I feel like that, yeah, it was just really helpful also to do it in front of other people. <laughs> There's like a difference. Um, it's sort of like when you get proofs or galleys um, of the the work to check over, and it becomes more real because you like see it in the magazine's font and everything, and you're like, okay, it's gonna be read by other people now. So let me make sure <laughs> that it's really, you know, maybe where it's at. So panic can be a great <laughs> motivator as well. Um, sometimes I will change the font that I'm writing in, too, to make it uglier, like, on purpose, because the stereotype with writers, like, we all love Garamond, because um, it makes everything look very nice, so sometimes I'll change it to, like, Comic Sans, <laughs> <laughs> to be like, is it still okay, <laughs> you know, when it looks that way, you know, yeah. Can I build on one thing that you said? I think it's really important to build a community of people who are willing to witness your work and process and people that you trust. I, I frankly don't like having other painters come into my studio because very quickly it devolves into shop talk. Oh, what are those brushes that you're using? Oh, that paint looks like, oh, you know, technique, technique, technique. And, and this sounds like a bad joke and it's not, but for a long time, there were three people I'd let in my studio, um, a rabbi, a poet, and an ancient Greek historian. <laughs> and, um, and these three people were all trained to read image and to look at image and unfold image and to think about meaning in image. And, and it, 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 they were generous to me at a, a moment that was very tender and vulnerable in my practice but they saw things that painters never saw. That's great, I love that. Thank you, um, this is gonna be a question for Pete. Um, the first time I got to come back here as an adult, I had just finished a very um, conceptual art degree in San Francisco and I, came walking up to the East End because I was looking for a painting that Sarah Oppenheimer had in the Bang Street Gallery. Sarah's a former fellow of the center here. Um, 
and the gallery was closed. And instead, I found uh, in the Standish House um, paintings of John Mulcahy's um, in the window, and I ended up falling in love and, and buying one of those at a very affordable cost. And one of the things I remember was um, I didn't have the form of payment, and the, the gallery owner just said, don't worry about it, send me a check when you get home. And that level of trust was so strong and so meaningful to me. And so I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about this street and the painters that you have met on this street and um, influences of the other landscape painters that you have uh, known. So I think this is in many ways a very generous community of creative people. And, um, and I'm, I feel extraordinarily lucky to be part of 411 Gallery, which is 16 local artists who all support one another in the development of a critical or of a, a creative life here. Um, I think, you know, I know other artists who show in other galleries as well. I think intentionality, what I was saying about the commons, I came, I mean, one of the reasons I got so involved in the commons is I came here and although I was old enough to know better, I still had in some part of me that young impulse that I'm here to consume the creative community in Provincetown. And I actually found it very cold and unwelcoming. Um, and I've subsequently come to understand that this is a place that a lot of people are transient and come through, but they come through this, I'm here to stay, I have wanted to live here forever, and I've arrived, and then the first winter hits, and it, 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 it takes a certain kind of interiority um, to be able to stay here in winters, if you, especially if you don't have a, a deep community. And I almost left, um, and and I'm really again I'm really committed to this notion of how do we create places where people can run into one another and find those kinds of connections. That's the, the sort of my sort of cautious response. I, I also think that this place is enormously generous. Um, I, you know, my gallerist will do th things like that with people maybe not that trusting, but will certainly, if someone wants a painting, um, you know, when I work in the gallery, I have a standing order. If it's a teacher or a social worker or a nurse, make it work, um, figure it out. Um, we want everyone to be able to have art in their lives. And so there is that kind of generosity that pervades this place. Um, but people do come and go, and, um, and, and I think it, my generosity towards the community in terms of my, uh, my original, like, you people are kind of mean, is a um, very odd place. <laughs> <laughs> and it's so small in the off season that one or two of those sort of broken promises can really hurt and can really shatter the lattice of your own friend network. That was dark. <laughs> Shattering.